All right, I'm back to doing exercises where I've already typed up the solutions, so I'll just go through these. Okay, so let's see here. So we have this textbook that we're looking at, um, numerical linear algebra, and we're doing exercise five from lecture two. Uh, for some reason, this textbook is broken up into lectures. Um, it's probably following like maybe this was a course and then each lecture corresponds to a, a lecture of the course that was being taught. Um, but yeah, each lecture has some number of exercises. Okay, so let's start with this one. So we have this uh, skew, we say that a, mat a matrix is skew Hermitian if S star is negative S. So it's like Hermitian, but with a negative sign. So we want to use exercise 2.3 to show that any skew Hermitian matrix has purely imaginary eigenvalues. Okay, so um, note that if you take the um, conjugate transpose of IS, then um, you can pull that scalar outside and when you pull the scalar outside of the complex conjugate, or outside of the conjugate transpose, you just get the complex conjugate of i. And of course, the complex conjugate of i is negative i, and the conjugate transpose of s is negative s, and so we end up with negative i times negative s, which is positive i s. And so that means that i s is Hermitian, because that's what it means. It means you, if you take the conjugate transpose, then you end up with the same thing. Now, let's see here. The problem told us to use exercise 2.3, and exercise 2.3a tells us that all eigenvalues of a Hermitian matrix are real. So if we let lambda be a eigenvalue of is, then lambda must be real. So lambda being an eigenvalue of is means that is times v is equal to lambda v for some non-zero vector v. Okay, so yeah, so let's suppose that lambda is an eigenvalue of s. Um, not an eigenvalue of is, but an eigenvalue of s. Then there is a non-zero vector v such that sv equals lambda v. Now if we multiply by i, we get isv equals i lambda v which means that I lambda is an eigenvalue of I s. But we just said that all of the eigenvalues of I s are real. And so in particular, I lambda must be real. And how could, so if you take lambda and multiply by I, then you get a real number. The only way that could happen is if lambda is purely imaginary. And this holds for any this holds for any eigenvalue of s, and hence all the eigenvalues of s are purely imaginary, and that completes the proof. All right, so the next part is to show that i minus s is non-singular, i.e., it's invertible. So suppose that we have an eigenvalue lambda of i minus s, and suppose the corresponding eigenvector is x. This means that x is not a non-zero vector such that i minus s times x is lambda x, and you multiply i minus s times x out, and you get, and you sort of solve, you solve for s times x, and you get 1 minus lambda times x. So therefore, 1 minus lambda is an eigenvalue of s. In part a, we proved that all eigenvalues of s must be purely imaginary, and so the eigenvalues of i minus s are of the form i minus, 1 minus i times y, where i here, of course, is the square root of negative 1, and y is a real number. So this i times y, this um, i times y is lambda here, because lambda is purely imaginary, so lambda can be written as i times y, where y is a real number, and so then if i times y is lambda, then 1 minus i y is 1 minus lambda. Okay, so Let's see here, so if we want 1 minus i times y to be 0, um, this, this, this can't happen. No, the, the set of points of the form 1 minus i y is, you could think of this as the, um, you take the imaginary, um, you take the imaginary line and shift it over by 1. 
and then it will no longer contain the point zero. And so no y, no real number y can satisfy the equation one minus i y equals zero because then you'd have one equals i times y. So y would be a real number such that you multiply by i and you get the real number one, which is impossible. So therefore, since one minus i y um, cannot be satisfied for any real number y, there's no way that zero can be an eigenvalue of i minus s. And we know from linear algebra that a matrix is non-singular if and only if it does not contain zero as an eigenvalue. And therefore, i minus s is non-singular, and that's what we wanted. Okay, and finally, we have this matrix Q equals I minus S inverse. Note that we needed to do part B in order to even state part C because part B is necessary to confirm that the inverse of I minus S even exists. Okay, so we have this matrix Q, which is called the Cayley transform of S, I guess, and we want to prove that it's unitary meaning we want to prove that its inverse is Q star. So we're going to use a few facts here. Um, if A is invertible, then so is A star. That's a fact. Um, for, furthermore, A star inverse is equal to A inverse star. This is something that was mentioned in the chapter, and you can prove it. Um, also, S star times S is, well, this is S times negative S. No, I think this should be flipped, because S star is equal to negative S, right? Yeah, S star equals negative S. So this is negative S times positive S. But it doesn't really matter, because... Here, well, we don't, we don't even need this, this part of the equation, because we just skip right ahead to minus S times S. Um, and then this... Okay, here... Here's here's what here's what I should have done. These two things should be flipped. So s star s is equal to negative s times s, and you can flip those two because you could just move the minus sign around because it's ju you're just multiplying by the scalar mo minus one, and so s times minus s equals minus s times s, and minus s times s is the same as s star times s, and so therefore if you flip these two um, things in the e in the equality here, then it's clear that you can prove, wait, no, 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 here's what I, here's what I was trying to prove. There, that's what I want. S times S star equals S times negative S, which is negative S times S, which is S star times S. Um, that's the important thing. The important thing is that you can, um, that S times S star equals S star times S. And then we use all of these facts and just do a bunch of algebra and get the answer. So Q times Q star, we have this part which is Q, and we have this part which is Q star. When you take the um, star of a product, you flip the order of the matrices and take the stars. So the Q part stays, and then you've got um, I plus S star, and then I minus S inverse star, and then you can um, flip the minus and the star. And then we can multiply together the two terms on the inside here to get 1 plus s plus s star plus s s star. The term on the left here is just rewriting negative s as positive s star. And this part, well, if you, um, uh, if you multiply the, or if you take the complex conjugate through, or the conjugate transpose 2, well the, compl the conjugate transpose of i is just i, and the conjugate transpose of s is s, so you end up with i minus s here. And then this i minus s star can be written as i plus, pos I plus s with no star, of course. And then here in this step, you can um, s times s star is the same as s star times s. And then you can factor this out, because if you multiply i plus s star times i plus s, you end up with what you have up here. And then you see we have something ti something's inverse times that thing times a thing times its inverse. And so this is just I. This part over here is I, and this part over here is I, and so we end up with I. So Q times Q star is I. And we know that Q is invertible. 
Right. Because Q is... Why is Q invertible? Q is this, is unitary. So we know I minus S is non-singular. Do we know that Q is invertible? I'm not sure. I don't I don't think we know that Q is invertible per se. Um so I guess it's not I guess I shouldn't have said since Q and Q star are invertible. Um because if Q is invertible, then um you can just pretty much finish up this exercise. But I guess what you have to do here is you have to actually multiply out Q star times Q. And if you multiply out Q star times Q, you get pretty much the exact same computation. Things are slightly different, um, but it looks almost identical. You do the same sort of thing. You have to rewrite the things on the outsides. You have to flip um, a conjugate transpose with an inverse. And you have to multiply out the two inside terms and then flip the star in the s times s term um but you'll get q star so th this should say similarly q star times q equals i as well and therefore since we have q times q star equals i and q star times q equals i q must be Q star must be the inverse of Q, and so Q star equals Q inverse, and that's what it means to be unitary, and hence Q is unitary, and this completes the exercise.